and welcome back. This is the Life Without Limits Family Wellness Show. We have a new season. Uh, I thought I'd like to break things up a little bit and give you some information that uh, maybe we've talked about, but in a little different format. One of the things that um, I've been collecting for years is research on some of the different aspects of chiropractic that most people aren't familiar with. Um, so in the beginning, I thought we'd talk a little bit about some of the research that's out there uh, to help people understand that chiropractic is being used really not for back pain and headache. That's such a small part of what we actually do. Uh, it's a very small piece of the pie. There's a lot of other things that chiropractic impacts. The research that we're about to talk about is not that chiropractic cures these diseases or illnesses. It was never designed to be that way. It's a different understanding completely because there's a different model of how the body works. Um, each of the things that we're going to talk about is benefited by chiropractic because the adjustment itself, which will be the, the core of what we talk about today, um, impacts the body in such a way that the nervous system improves its function. When your nervous system is, is functioning and behaving the way that it's supposed to, normal body function um, balances and is restored. Each time that change occurs, then the body is given an increased ability to heal or adapt. That makes a huge difference on the body. And if we make those kinds of changes uh, through the adjustment, which is non-invasive, um, non-medicine based, then the body has the opportunity to heal. So one of the th first things I thought we'd talk about, because my practice is at least 50% pediatric, um, is colic. Colic is a really common problem with children. Uh, it's a spasticity, which is really what colic means. It's a spasming of the intestines. Um, and it's beyond the simple, uh, the baby has gas phase. Uh, it can be really uncomfortable. The baby can cry for hours on end, have long sleepless nights. And this can go on for weeks or even months. So one of the earliest studies that um, we did looked at the fact that chiropractic adjustment impact a child's ability to heal when colic is present. The study was done that we're going to talk about today was the Journal of Manipulation uh, and Physical Therapy. That particular study was done in 1989, so this is not new. Uh, this has been around for quite some time, and this research continues to be repeated to be validated, and we've seen just that. This study was, um, as I said, done in 1989, and what it found is there was a satisfactory result occurred within two weeks in 94% of the cases uh, of children receiving chiropractic care. So in the opening of the show, if you caught that, you saw that there were children on the table and being adjusted. One of the main reasons that children are adjusted is because they can have a subluxation, which is what we'll get to in a few minutes. They can have a subluxation just like an adult can. And a subluxation, the simplest way to understand this, is a m small misalignment. If that misalignment is left, then the body has to adapt. And the body is always seeking to adapt. And when it does, then we see spasm occur. There are changes in blood flow. Um, and these are just the local events. But hormones get affected. And obviously, nerve function, not only right there where the injury is, but wherever that goes. And your nerves do go to your intestines as well as all of your organs. So colic falls within that realm of, of possibility that things that are adjusted that actually improve. Um, the subluxation itself, though, uh, probably the biggest thing I want people to understand is it is not a displacement of the bones. That's a dislocation. That's a surgical event. You would know it if you had it. Um, it is a small misalignment. So we're never popping anything back. You're never popping anything out. Um, the big deal is, though, if this goes on and the body does adapt to it, then you do make very real changes to your physiology, to the bone structure, to the muscles, tendons, and ligaments. And we don't generally see that in children. That takes several years to occur. But the question most people ask is, well, how did my child get that way? A child can be subluxated a number of ways. One is simply posture, even a baby, um, children who sleep chronically on their stomach. And if that's the only way you can get your child to sleep, I'm not telling you you got to flip them. But I will tell you, you're putting a great deal more strain on their neck by them being in that position. And it's a very common thing that it results in subluxation. Uh, the other thing is birth itself. Uh, I've done many shows where we talked about the effects of the birth process. And some birth processes very often can be very, very difficult for that child. Uh, and that can cause that subluxation too, even if it's a standard birth, even if forceps weren't used or it wasn't vacuum. And the other common thought is, well, I had a cesarean, so it wasn't that bad. Cesareans generally are a small bikini incision. They're about eight centimeters, which is roughly four inches. It's not a big, it's not a big distance. It's not a lot bigger than my fist. So to get a child through there, it sometimes can also be very difficult. Um, some obstetricians are using larger incisions now, thank goodness, because it's easier on the child. But that still goes on, and subluxation can, in fact, occur at birth. So colic is one of those things, and with a 94% um, correction in the, uh, in the children in two weeks, that's a pretty big deal for a sleepless parent. Moving on, blood pressure. This has been um, documented extensively and was just all over the television and the lay publications as well. Um, 
this was done in 1988. Again, not a new study, although it has been repeated and, as I said, validated. But what they found is with 21 hypertensive patients or patients with high blood pressure, they adjusted them in the T1 to T5 range and they saw an improvement. Now, this isn't to say everybody out there throw away your blood pressure medication, but what it does mean is you may want to consider chiropractic in addition to what you're already doing to see if, in fact, you do have a subluxation in the area that could be affecting blood pressure because your nervous system does control blood pressure through a very small plexus of nerves in your uh, artery in the neck. Ulcers, 11 patients receiving chiropractic care were compared to 24 cases treated medically. The chiropractic group experienced remission demonstrated with an endoscope, in other words, looking down the throat and pain relief an average of 10 days earlier than traditional care. So there's a number of things going on out there as far as the research goes that goes way beyond back pain and headache and we're seeing changes in those groups um, that's pretty extensive and is able to be um, confirmed either here it was an endoscope they actually looked down the throat and said yes we see a difference. Nothing heals the body but the body and given an opportunity it will heal. Last one, dysmenorrhea, often um, pain occurring with a woman's cycle. This was 45 subjects. Um, the conclusion was that there was a beneficial effect and it was a safe, non-drug approach. A lot of women are suffering from this and it's a simple way uh, to address that because the nerves that come out of the low back go right to that part of the body. They go to the uterus, they go to the ovaries, they go to all the muscles that are affected by that area as well. So it's a simple uh, thing that you can look at. It's a consideration. Um, it's low intensity, very gentle adjustments, and most chiropractors are capable of making this distinction and determining if, in fact, that that subluxation is related to that problem. So stick with us. We'll be back in a minute. We'll talk about exactly how that adjustment works. surprised to know the biggest dangers your pet faces are everyday dangers like drinking from puddles, being boarded, squirrels in the park, and fleas and ticks. Being a pet is risky business. That's why it's important for every pet to receive a risk assessment and wellness exam twice a year. A risk assessment from your veterinary professionals helps create a unique risk profile for your dog or cat. Your veterinarian can then develop a disease protection plan that's right for your pet and the disease threats in your area. Best of all, twice a year exams help your veterinarian detect, treat, or prevent health problems before they become serious. So reduce the risks. Contact your veterinarian today for your pet's wellness exam because being a pet is risky business. A message from the American Veterinary Medical Association and your local veterinarians. Tell me what's bothering you. As a hot dog, I know I'm responsible for some bad things. Now they say my cholesterol is a risk factor for stroke. And how does that make you feel? Like a big weedy. High cholesterol is an important risk factor for strokes. Eating right and exercising can help. But National Stroke Association wants you to know that even the healthiest people are at risk. So ask medicines that can lower cholesterol, like statins. Ask your doctor about It's even more important if you've already had a stroke. Visit stroke.org today. Hello, welcome back. Uh, as I said, we'd be talking about the adjustment at the, at the next uh, part of the show. The reason I want to talk about the adjustment is because most people are unfamiliar with or, or have a different thought in their head about exactly what the adjustment is or how it works. 
Um, the adjustment itself, and that's the chiropractic application um, of a very low force, a gentle force, to get the body to move into a new direction. It's not that the adjustment is specific to colic, as we mentioned earlier, or blood pressure, something like that, that there's a specific adjustment that fixes blood pressure or colic. It's that the adjustment is a communicative event. It allows the body to communicate in a way that it wasn't doing before. And when that happens, then the body increases its ability to not only adapt, but to heal. So what I think the best way is to discuss Dr. Godfrey Gutman, actually an MD, uh, who had this to say, the subluxation, this is what the chiropractor is actually adjusting, this is the misalignment that we spoke about, may best be interpreted as an impairment of drive. This was written by joint play. In other words, how those joints are actually moving. And that could be in an extremity, it could be in the spine. Um, it is best described as an impairment of the gliding axis and of the joint surfaces, and it causes a pathomechanical effect. What that really means is there's a change in the body's physiology due to how the mechanics of the body is actually working. So this brings the understanding not from a chemical standpoint that your chemistry's off, but from a structural standpoint. And the last thing he had to say is that we really need to consider this as a communicative event, especially of the pathological input to the brain. So if the body isn't moving properly, then it loses the ability to deliver information to the brain so that you can make the right decisions, whether that be about digestion, blood pressure, or anything else. The for that. So as I was saying earlier, this is the simplest way to understand this. The hands simply in this position are in the appropriate position. The adjustment then is to restore glide and glide easily. If you misalign that slightly, then the muscles aren't going to be able to tolerate that. So as chiropractors, we talk about a misalignment, not about a popping out of bones or a moving around of bones. That misalignment leads to muscle spasm. And that muscle spasm always goes right along with pain and inflammation. If that occurs, if that misalignment occurs, then that pain and inflammation is going to be the next most common event. The pain is there to tell you to slow down. It tells you what you can do and what you can't. So listening to the body is really important. Right now in our culture, though, we very often are working towards turning that pain off. Get rid of the pain as quickly as possible, whether that's an over-the-counter pain reliever or something given to you by the doctor. The problem with this is if you can't feel the pain, if you don't know where your limits are, the chances of you going out and doing more damage or just continuing on with your life as is uh, and continuing to do the same activities that may have brought you to that injury in the first place are much higher. The inflammatory response is really important. That inflammatory response allows the body to bring more blood to the tissue. When you do that, and it's about 10 times the amount, you bring greater immune function to that area, not only for cleanup, but also for repair. And that's how healing occurs. That immune system is not just there to fight infection. It's also a very critical part of our healing process. So pain, inflammation, and spasm are critical. When we do the normal uh, cocktail of, of medicines that most people go through, when this hits, we end up with an anti-inflammatory, so we're slowing down the blood flow of the area to the tissue so that it can heal. We give them a pain reliever so they're not hurting so much anymore. And the last thing we usually give them is a steroid. The problem with this is you've, neg you've negated all the protective effects that the body's used to bring healing to that tissue. If you do this, and you do it for a prolonged period of time, then your ability to continue to function and grow properly is being decreased. If you're young, which is what happens in, in uh, most youth athletics. My son's playing football even now at the eight and nine year olds. And the pounding that those kids take is, is significant. But because they're so little and most of their bodies are really healthy, we go, oh, you're okay. Every dad out there is the doctor on the field. And we rub it for them and put them back in there. If the subluxation truly occurred though, we haven't really done much except send them back out into maybe um, the next play or, or the next game or the rest of the season with an injury that's there. And that sometimes then grows because by the time I see some of these kids, it's been six months or a year or 10 years. It may be that 20 year old who comes in who then have the car wreck and the sports accident and all the other stuff who gets up one day and says, boy, I, you know, I'm in a lot of pain today. I don't understand where this came from. And we look at them because of their age and say, ah, it's probably nothing. Here's a painkiller. If that happens, we're just continuing the cycle. So this is where the adjustment comes in. And the biggest thing to understand about the adjustment or chiropractic in general is that adjustments are repetitive. And probably the, the thing that most of us as chiropractors need to work on is our educational process about why they're repetitive. Since the bones don't pop out and we're not popping them back, it's not a one-time event. Since healing is a process and processes take time, there's repetition there. Because if you've had an injury and it's gone longer than 72 hours or even a week, then you've already moved into a, the state where you're creating a totally different type of scar tissue. It's less elastic, it's weaker, and it's more prone to re-injury. So to overcome that, there has to be a new process in, a, in place. The adjustment itself is repetitious because you're asking the body to go from this state, 
which is the misalignment, the spasm, the change in blood flow, and if it's been there for a long time, years, then the actual change to the structure of the body, you're asking it to go from there to there. That process is in place because you're changing those tissues cell by cell. And the other thing is this has become a habit. If that injury exists and has been there for any length of time, that habit is in place and the body has developed that and strengthened it. If you're going to change a habit, you need to practice it. So repetition is the key because if you habituate an injury, the longer it's there, the more likely it's going to stay there if no intervention occurs and the more damage occurs because your body's not compensating throughout. So that change is slow and repetitious so that the body can learn to habituate a new process. That new habit, that new learning process, which the, the spine can do, the nervous system can do, and also um, your whole, the muscles, tendons, ligaments, all those things can change as long as there's good blood flow there. So we need the pain, we need the inflammation, we need the spasm. If it's super intense, fine. Use those interventions um, that are drug-based, but don't stop there because there's no, there's no rule anywhere that says you can't cross those two things over. I have to tell you, I get referrals from neurosurgeons, orthopedists, and so on, when their thought is, this isn't a surgical procedure yet. Let's do something now. If we can, then we can make a change. And very often we've been able to do that, but you gotta be consistent. If you're consistent, then those changes will occur. If you give it time, new tissue will come along. And the nervous tissue is the most complex tissue in the body. It takes the longest to heal. So give it a chance. Get the repetition in there. It's not a one-time event. Um, and give the body the, the necessary nutrients as well it needs to build a new tissue. It only needs a few weeks um, of consistent input, and you'll begin to see that change really quickly. Stay with us when we're back to uh, bring it all together and end with what's called a Cairo thought. Um, hang on. The power's out, but your food safety plan is on. Don't open the fridge. Foods will be safe for up to four hours if the door stays closed. Keep the freezer shut, too. If it's full, the food will stay frozen for about two days. When power returns, make sure freezer foods have ice crystals and check fridge foods with a food thermometer to make sure they're at 40 degrees or below. If not, or if there's any doubt, throw it out. Learn more at www.askkaren.gov or call the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Meat and Poultry Hotline at one 888 hotline My service gear. I look sharp. I want to help people. I want to make a difference. I want to get things done. Join America. What have you done for your marriage today? I took the baby while she worked. Today we've actually organized a date night tonight. I got up with the baby while he slept. Yeah. What have I done for my marriage today? That is a great question. I have carried my wife's purse. Boy, I gave a huge hug this morning, like a really big squeeze. We're going to the museums as a family. What have you done for your marriage today? Don't forget the small stuff. Need ideas? Go to foryourmarriage.org. A message from the Catholic Church. This is the training manual for a 747, and these are the documents you'll sign at closing. Now, no one climbs into the cockpit without knowing this inside and out. Yet while making the biggest purchase of their lives, most people only pretend to read these. That's why the Mortgage Bankers Association made The Simple Facts, something you can read and understand long before closing to help you get the loan that makes sense for you. Get your copy at HomeLoanLearningCenter.com. The Simple Facts. The name says it all. Hello and welcome back. Um, Chiro thoughts is what we're going to end with, and I've, and I've uh, tried to put this together in a way that we could have something that would bring um, the whole topic together from the research perspective all the way down to um, the middle portion where we're really talking about the core of what's going on to something that will wrap it together. Chiro thoughts have been in chiropractic, and they're just uh, little weekly emails that come out to help people understand in the, in the simplest way possible what it really means to approach health from a different perspective. Um, these are written by uh, a colleague, and this week's Chiro thought is called, Will Your Kids Be Elephants on a String? 
And it's an interesting perspective. If you've ever been to the circus, an elephant you'll very often see is on a very small chain or even a rope. It's tied around one leg and they stay. Now all of us know the power of an elephant um, and that they're capable of easily breaking that string. But what they've learned is something called learned helplessness, which is they no longer test that string. They no longer go in that direction because they start these elephants off with massive chains around their leg and they have them go to the end of their limit. They can't break that huge chain and as they work on this, they consistently go to smaller and smaller chains. Eventually, some of the best trainers get these elephants down to a very thin rope. That learned helplessness is the same effect that occurs when that subluxation is present. It's the reason for the adjustment. The spine actually learns to be dysfunctional. Some of the newest research that exists today in neurophysiology, um, in psychology, and, and uh, the other fields that are really changing how they focus uh, on the human body and how they approach it um, are really beginning to see how flexible the mind as well as the nervous system actually is. Before we used to think that the nervous system was hardwired. What you got is what you got. We used to say the same thing about your DNA, um, but both of those things have proved to be false. So if we can begin to change how we speak to our children and really how we approach health in general, um, then we have a greater opportunity to heal and to grow. The elephant on a string concept I think is really important because learned helplessness exists in a lot of areas. It can exist in an area of school where a child is having a particular uh, problem in a, diff in, a, in a specific class all the way down to our health. If we teach those children when they're not feeling well, this is what you do. You lay down, you take this, you don't move. Um, and that's when we, they receive the greatest amount of um, comfort or care or attention. And they're gonna use that to their advantage. Children are very smart that way. If we can help them have a wellness mindset, which says, I know you're not feeling well, and yes, you need to rest, and here are the steps that we're going to take. However, I want you to understand that your body's gonna heal and be fine. Um, that may sound a little funny to, to say to a child, but believe it or not, kids really understand this. I have three children of my own, and my youngest is four and a half years old, uh, and that half is really important to her. She will tell you that, yes, she isn't feeling that great right now, but she'll be fine in a day or so. That's really important because for a fact, we understand that your thought process is directly affecting your immune response. And people that are very laid back um, or who are... Um, in a space where there's even a slight depression, and this isn't, we're rarely gonna see this in children, but we know that that immune system is affected. It's depressed, along with the whole rest of the body. So the ability to change focus and teach them that young has a really big impact on them later, and there's no doubt about that, that research is in. Um, if we can teach them in a new way, give them new concepts, and help them to understand that, then that's pretty significant. Uh, one of the other things about the learned helplessness concept is that it develops uh, limiting thoughts those limiting thoughts can overflow, not just in their health, but to in all other areas. I'm not going to be successful at that. There's no way I can do that. And it may hold them back in multiple areas, whether that's sports or getting a job later or so on. I happen to be a big picture person, so it's very easy for me to kind of extrapolate that concept out and say, well, yeah, from zero to seven, their mind is the most flexible. What we're teaching them at that point um, is critical to how they learn to think later, because learning to think is what really goes on. It's not just a matter of putting information in the brain and regurgitating it later. It's actually teaching them how to think uh, for themselves. So those small building blocks, um, or what seems small now, could be really big later and have a huge impact on how they function and what they choose. Um, the same is true when it comes to diet. Um, I think a lot of people are unaware of the fact that uh, there are certain things in their foods or choices related to food that are directly impacting their bodies. I don't know if you've seen it lately. There's a new commercial out on television that talks about corn syrup. Uh, a guy is offered a popsicle and he says, oh, no, I don't want that. It's got corn syrup in it. And she says, why? What's the big deal with corn syrup? And he can't answer her. And the very next thing is corn syrup's fine. It's good for you. Don't worry about it. Uh, it's in a lot of things. It's not an issue. And they even have a website you can go to that specifically states the benefits of it. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there. That commercial happens to be one of them. Corn syrup directly affects the body. It directly affects how your, your pancreas functions, your digestive system, and so on. There's a lot of people who can't tolerate it, and it is, in fact, in a lot of different things. So if we can teach people how to think and um, how to respond appropriately in those situations, then even children can say, hey, that's got food dye in it. I'm not allowed to have that. Um, or that has got corn syrup in it. And if parents are watching closely, you'll be able to see the changes in that child and how they think and how they act uh, and even how they behave. 
food dye is probably one of the biggest things out there that can affect the child negatively. Um, it doesn't really break down in the body. And food dye has, has a specific effect that not a lot of other things have. When you get food dyes together, they have an exponential effect on each other. It's not just a singular event, you've got red and blue. And most things, especially the things we market to children today, do have food dye in them. Um, but most things have multiple colors in there. Those two or three or four food dyes all in one product definitely affect the body. And they affect the body because they're having more than a, just a, a one or two um, different color effect on how they're digesting. Because they can't break it down, it sits in the body. And there's no long-term studies to show that food dye is, is safe. So while you don't have to go home and throw everything away that's in your cupboards, um, you may want to consider exactly what it is they're getting and teach them to ask good questions. Uh, even little ones are capable of doing this. Um, given that opportunity, they'll make better choices. And if they're not getting those kinds of things on a regular basis, they're going to gravitate towards the fruits and the things that you want them to eat. Uh, and if those things are more available, one of the simplest things you can do is have it out. If you have it out where they can reach it, they're going to be much more likely uh, to choose that. If the other stuff is more accessible or there's more of it, um, then they're going to go there. Kids are, kids are very simple in that regard. Put in front of them what it is that you want them to have, and they're going to choose that. If the choice is between strawberries, bananas, and pears, not strawberries and ice cream, then it's pretty simple where they're going to go. If that ice cream is, a, is one of the things in there, then I think that's going to be difficult for you to get strawberries in them. Um, but that elephant on a string concept, really basic, really simple way to go, and it takes them out of that helpless phase. Even young, they're capable of standing up for themselves, thinking their own thoughts, uh, and making changes in their health, in their life, uh, and in their relationships. And it may seem like a, a, a long way to go with such a simple thing for kids, but um, it is absolutely one of those easy concepts that they will pick up. So consider elephants on a string. The other thing is if you have any questions, uh, or if I've covered anything today that you're not 100% clear on, or you just want to email me about something that um, we've talked about, feel free. Uh, my email will be up. You're welcome to do that. I usually return that uh, in a day or two. Um, if you have a thought for something that you want to see covered here, please send it in. And if we can uh, add it, we'll do that. Also, if you would like to see any of the research that we've covered today, you're welcome to stop by or ask me for it. Have a great week.